smile, everybody. We're smiling. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to a virtual seminar presented by Dollar Wealth Management at National Bank Financial featuring NEI Investments. My name is Sienna Foyanesi, and I'm an associate with Dalla Wealth Management. At Dalla Wealth Management, we strive to inspire, create, and develop positive change by optimizing your wealth with investment and portfolio management strategies that are tax efficient and built with you in mind. Our agenda today will respect your time as we aim to keep this presentation short and to the point to maximize its value. I would like to introduce the head of Dalla Wealth Management at National Bank Financial, Romal Dalla. Romel is a portfolio manager with 15 years of experience who combines his investment expertise with the team's in-depth financial and estate planning. Romel will now introduce the principles of NEI investment, will then discuss their business model and opportunity, market outlook, and answer a few questions. I'd like to hand it over to Romel to tell you more about NEI investments. Thanks, Sienna. And once again, thanks for listening in to our virtual seminar. I'd like to begin by telling you how I found out about NEI funds and then introduce the principals of the company who are with us here today. Back in 2007, clients started to ask me about ethical investments and how we could incorporate them into their portfolios. In response, I created a stock-based US and Canadian investment portfolio that focused on sectors of the market that were considered ethical. So no weapons or alcohol or tobacco, et cetera. The portfolio did well but it wasn't diversified enough. There was a need to expand our coverage on a global basis. And this is where my due diligence of all the ethical investment firms out there led me to NEI Investments and more specifically, their flagship fund, the Environmental Leaders Fund. Joining us today are John Bay and Amy Palmer of NEI Investments. John Bay is Senior Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of NEI Investments and Avisio Wealth. John is responsible for the firm's asset allocation and investment strategy and is sub-advisor research and due diligence. John brings more than 25 years of investment industry experience, having worked for some of Canada's top financial institutions. Prior to joining NEI, John led product and investment teams at Merrill Lynch Canada, TD, Dynamic Mutual Funds and Hollis Wealth. There he founded and chaired asset allocation and investment portfolio committees led manager oversight activities, and was responsible for research teams that covered equities, fixed income, mutual funds, ETFs, and alternative products. Amy Palmer is Vice President Sales Manitoba for NEI Investments. Her role in partnering with advisors like me is to help deliver responsible investing solutions to Canadians. I'd like Amy and John now to begin their presentation. Thank you, Romel. Um, John and I are thrilled to be here. So I will take a moment and introduce NEI Investments, Canada's leading provider for responsible investing solutions. We seek to help investors grow their wealth while building a better and more sustainable future for all. Our diversified lineup of investment solutions leverages the strength of our in-house portfolio managers, our world-class sub-advisors, and our environmental, social, and governance teams. John will shed light on industry trends and to Ramel's point, we will showcase our premier solution, the NEI Environmental Leaders Fund. This strategy addresses core issues with overpopulation and limited finite resources. We at NEI are committed to helping Canadians meet their financial goals while having a positive societal and environmental impact. We are building a better world for today and for generations to come. And with that, I will pass it off to John Bay, our Senior Vice President and Chief Investment Officer. John, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, my absolute pleasure to be with you all here today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be with us today. I'm going to start off by um, just sharing my screen here. And um, well, there's important disclosure and documents that we all have to show. And then uh, well, there's a picture of me. So let me start off with a quick question. Is it possible for an oil and Canadian oil and gas company to respond to climate change? And um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that uh, that climate change is a difficult topic, particularly for Canadians who live out west. COVID has been particularly hard on oil demand. The international demand fell by 9.3. Uh, million barrels a day, uh, or about 10 times higher than the effects of the global financial crisis. 
Longer term, oil demand faces longer term headwinds with the world moving to zero carbon emissions by 2050. But even in this difficult environment, some Canadian companies are seeing a long term shift to a low carbon future as an opportunity. Vermilion Energy, for instance, is a good example of this. They have these operations in France where uh, uh, their France production facilities that is operating in innovative ways. They are taking waste heat from the extraction process that naturally heats water to 60 degrees Celsius and using that heat to provide an adjacent greenhouse operation, uh, the ability to grow tomatoes at an industrial scale. And they're providing this energy free of charge for the next 25 years. And because of this in ingenuity, uh, this Canadian energy company is able to gr you know, grow 15,000 tons of fresh tomatoes, avoid 15,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, and create 350 long-term jobs uh, that otherwise might not have been there. So instead of spewing greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, they're using their oil and gas operations to use ge geothermal heat to grow fresh food and provide additional jobs in the local community. That is the type of innovation that we need and that will be critical in the 10 years ahead. So we enter the, uh, the decade in crisis. We've, in 2020, we've seen a healthcare crisis and a global pandemic named COVID and the coronavirus. We're seeing an economic crisis uh, with the shutdown in response to this COVID uh, global pandemic to save a uh, human toll on lives. We're seeing a social crisis and Black Lives Matters. We've seen an oil crisis and uh, seeing something that I never thought I would see in my lifetime, negative oil prices very, very briefly. And as well, we're experiencing a climate crisis. And I have a picture there of the apocalyptic forest fires uh, that we saw earlier this year in California. So the key question is why is all of this happening? One of the insights that we need to realize is that the current economic system uh, is, um, is, is broken, that we, need to, that we are living beyond the means of the planet, and that's creating exogenous shocks to many systems. In my mind, there's no coincidence that in 2020, we are dealing with all of these crises. So if we want to continue to grow the economy, we need to make sure that we have a new kind of economic system, a, a new kind of finance, where investors and lenders are putting more money to use in ways that are positive for both the planet, profits, and people. And we call that new kind of financial system, sustainable finance. So as we enter the decade in crisis, the critical question is, can we end the decade with progress? And, that, and, and that's where uh, sustainable finance uh, gives us the tools to think about how we can get that done. So as I think about the next 10 years, I, I see the, the future uh, where that we're undergoing four critical uh, transitions. I think that I see the future as smarter. And this is the whole transition from the physical to a digital world in the digital economy. The future will also be cleaner as we transition from high carbon to a low carbon world, creating that transition to a sustainable economy. The future will be more resilient uh, as we go from vulnerabilities to the abilities to withstand increased exogenous shocks. And the future will also be fairer, and this is a transition to an inclusive economy, moving from the inequalities that we see to a better distribution of wealth. And it's not just uh, us who think of, uh, thinks about these transitions. There are major actors across the capital market spectrum that are beginning to respond to these transitions. Uh, first ones are central bankers. Uh, there are over 60 central bankers and regulators that have formed the supervisors, uh, sorry, network for greening of the financial system that are defining best practice in climate risk management. Climate risk management is becoming a big topic for, for central banks, and Canada is playing a prominent role with the Bank of Canada uh, recently being named as one of three organizations um, named to the steering committee of this uh, greening of financial system. Regulators are also responding. If you take a look at the 50 largest economies in the world, you'll see that there are over 700 policy revisions that encourage investors to consider long-term value drivers, including E, S, and G factors, and that stands for environmental, social, and governance. And we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Asset managers are also responding to the challenge 
uh, there have been over a hundred trillion dollars of assets or 3,100 uh, signatories uh, that have committed that they will be investing and consider um, res responsible investment in their investment activities. And NEI has been a Canadian RI leader and has joined this organization from the very beginning. And corporations are responding as well. In 2019, in a, in a real pivotal event, uh, the Business Roundtable, comprised of the 181 CEOs of the largest U.S. corporations, have declared that the purpose of a corporation is not just to serve the shareholders, uh, their official position since 1997, but to create value for all stakeholders, including delivering value to their customers, investing in their employees, dealing fairly and ethically with their suppliers, supporting the communities in which they work in, as well as generating long-term value for shareholders. And then finally, investors are responding as well. Uh, you'll see here that in 2019, uh, flows into responsible investments attracted by Morningstar uh, hit record flows in 2019. And I will tell you that in 2020, uh, these record flows continue to accelerate. So, um, you know, the bottom message from all of this here is that your portfolio can have positive environmental, social, and government uh, effect on uh, so environmental, social, and governance issues. So let me answer the question on what is, John, responsible investing? Responsible investing is really about combining uh, both standard traditional financial analysis, uh, considering things like earnings growth, balance sheets, and cash flow growth, combined with ESG analysis that considers the impact of environmental, social, and governance factors on company performance. And we believe that combination of traditional financial analysis, as well as ESG analysis, creates a much more informed investment decision uh, that can create sustainable value for your portfolio. So what are ESG factors? Well, they're simply asking three simple questions. Number one on the environment, are the companies good stewards of the environment? You know, are they, um, you know, are they, um, uh, what's their stance on pollution? Uh, are they, um, uh, you know, on social factors? Are companies uh, appropriately managing relationships with staff, clients, and communities? Is there child labor in their supply chain? Are workers in there uh, are working under uh, good working conditions? And on the governance factors, are companies, um, company leadership structures diverse, fair, and progressive? And this is particularly true to at the board representation that it creates uh, a, a much more diversified leadership uh, perspective. And so, um, and so, why responsible investing? Well, many uh, uh, many investors, and this is according to a recent Nuveen survey in 2020, uh, that when asked why responsible investing, uh, that uh, investors say, "I believe investing responsibly could have a positive impact on my rates of return." And there are 69% of investors who's, who, uh, who agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. And if you look at investment advisors, 70% of investment advisors when surveyed said that, um, that ES and G or responsible investing can help uh, increase the risk profile of their portfolios. But still, even though there are performance and uh, risk um, mitigation effects of responsible investing, uh, that, that still making a difference is still vital for many investors. And so while um, and the majority here is according to this um, same survey, that uh, the majority still want their investments to contribute to a better world with 79% indicate that they wanted their investments to advance uh, environmental sustainability. So as we start thinking about the future uh, 10 years uh, and, uh, and look ahead on these uh, themes, you know, traditionally, uh, portfolio managers have optimized our portfolios across two dimensions. This is the risk dimension as well as the return dimension. And now we're seeing that, that, that institutional money manager are now adding a third dimension to their investment portfolio optimization process. That's called real world impact. They're not only asking questions like what rates of return are you seeking? They're looking at what and what risks are you willing to take? They're asking questions on what future real world impact do you want to achieve? So what is impact investing? And so, uh, you know, we're very pleased to introduce Canada's first impact suite uh, with impacts uh, equities and impact bonds, as well as an impact balanced portfolio. And so impact investing is new to uh, many investors here in Canada. And so I thought st we'd start with a definition by the Global Impact Investment Network. Uh, impact investments are investments made with the intention 
to generate positive, measurable social environmental impact alongside financial return. So let's unpack that very quickly. And what that definition is telling us is that there's three necessary components of impact invest investing. Number one is intentionality. Are the investments seeking to generate positive social and or environmental impact? It's not enough to have this uh, uh, positive impact. Uh, so for instance, investing in technology companies may not have a, a strong environmental impact, but that's not intentional. Uh, so what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that these uh, companies have intentionality. Second question is measure, measurability, where these investments uh, um, have social and environmental impacts that are measurable and measured. Uh, and, 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 and so it's not enough just to hope that they'll have positive impact. We wanna be accountable to that and measure that impact on an annual basis. And finally, the third necessary component is financial return. That this is unlike for the philanthropy, these investments seek to generate positive rates of return. And at NEI, we have benchmarked these against core portfolio benchmarks, uh, such as um, uh, the world um, MSCI uh, world indices. So the impact strategy considers both financial and social returns. Uh, on here, you see traditional vesting on the left-hand side, which are financial considerations only, traditional philanthropy on the right-hand side that consider social considerations only, and impact investing is truly in the sweet spot, uh, considering both financial and social considerations. Uh, the, the target, some of the biggest social environmental challenges that we have, uh, for instance, on the environment, which is the far right-hand box, you'll see that uh, you know, we're looking for to seek exposure to alternative energy, energy efficiency, uh, effective waste management uh, on the life essentials, uh, again, looking to increase the affordable housing stock, clean water, uh, and sustainable agriculture, as well as human uh, rights on a digital divide in education. And what's really um, interesting about impact investing is that traditionally, uh, this has been the domain of private markers, uh, private markets, and now uh, with uh, this impact suite, we are now being, being able to bring impact investing available to all investors. And the, you know, just to, to blow out one of those themes, renewable energy sector, for instance, uh, is a potential $10 trillion opportunity where approximately $1.5 trillion have been invested in, uh, in renewable energy capacity over the last five years. Uh, looking forward over the next 10 years, uh, given what we're seeing in terms of government commitments, both at, uh, uh, at the EU, at European Union, uh, Canada, Paris Accord, as well as with Joe Biden uh, now being president-elect of the United States, uh, we see uh, investments in renewable sector anywhere between the next five and 10 trillion over the next 10 years. So uh, that's all great, John, but how do we in uh, take advantage of some of these investment opportunities? So we'd like to introduce the NEI Environmental Leaders Fund. This is Canada's largest impact, uh, impact uh, equity fund. It invests in companies that are addressing some of the world's biggest resource challenges. That's water, energy, food, and waste. You know, this is a global, uh, proven global impact equity solution uh, with a tremendous four-year track record uh, and seeks to invest in companies with faster than average profit growth. So again, uh, what we are looking for, profitable companies that have faster than index uh, 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 earnings growth, we, they, they wanna be innovative, leading edge impact solution investing on environmental and resource optimization themes. Uh, managed, it's managed by Impacts Management, a recognized global leader and award-winning leader in sustainable investing. And as well, it's measurable. Uh, the environmental and social impacts of the portfolio is measured and reported regularly. And so really, if you think about the investment thesis of the Environmental uh, Leaders Fund, it is investing in the transition to a more sustainable eco uh, economy, where traditionally over the last 50 years, we've, uh, we've, we've had this deplete of economic model uh, where growth has ignored social environmental costs uh, leading to sustainability challenges and using the disruptions of technology, changing consumer preferences, uh, social factors and, and, and increased regulation, we're seeing uh, a transition to a more sustainable economic model where growth uh, can, can, can coincide with improved social and environmental outcomes. And that creates sustainable business models that again are much more durable uh, to exogenous shocks. And so again, 
Uh, if we look at um, the, the, the environmental markets equity universe, uh, we can uh, bucket this into four different categories, thinking about new energy. Uh, this is uh, uh, alternative energy, uh, such as solar, wind, biofuels, and others, but also energy efficiency. Um, as we save uh, power through power networks, industrial and building, transportation and consumer uh, initiatives. Uh, well, there's also water, uh, and uh, water is increasingly becoming a scarce resource. Uh, and so how do we uh, ensure that as the planet uh, begins to uh, increase in population, that, um, that the people have access to clean water? Uh, and so this is, requires uh, increased investments in infrastructure, treatment and utilities, as well as pollution control uh, and sustainable food, agriculture and forestry. Again, how are we feeding uh, the world's population in a sustainable way? Uh, this is, um, you know, again, we'll have an example of this a little bit later, as well as waste uh, resource recovery. Again, how do we uh, increase the recycled nature of our uh, waste and reduce our waste footprint uh, and, and, and create better footprints on from that perspective as well? The Environmental Leaders uh, Fund is broadly diversified across uh, these segments here. Uh, we have water efficiency, uh, food, pollution control, etc. cetera. Uh, and again, this is the, um, the, the, um, the annual report card that we produce on the Environmental Leaders, where $10 million invested uh, in the Environmental Leaders Fund will be the equivalent of taking 110 cars off annually off the road, a road by reducing uh, 500 tons of CO2 emissions. Uh, again, uh, it uh, generates renewable energy equivalent to 130 households of annual electricity consumption. Uh, uh, water, uh, 400 megaliters of water saved and treated, and almost 2,000 tons of materials recovered and treated. And again, it's really important to note on this slide that while we are measuring environmental impact. Uh, you know, this fund isn't optimized to maximize um, the uh, CO2 emissions avoided, for instance, because we have the dual mandate of ensuring positive impact, but also ensuring uh, market returns or better. And so, you know, just to give you a quick uh, case study, uh, we are invested in a, a company that has a drone um, um, uh, uh, well, this is precision agriculture that uses drones actually to um, to uh, control uh, the application of fertilizers, which reduces the amount of fertilizers that need to be generated to uh, increase the crop uh, product productive, uh, and uh, and uses uh, less water uh, as well as uh, in that uh, farming process. And the impact of this uh, is 8.8 .8 million tons of CO2 annually through the, the, the application of precision fertilizer, reducing the waste that is needed. Uh, again, um, to reduce fossil fuel consumption, uh, if we could take uh, uh, carbon emissions of 16 million cars off the road, again, this is a German industrial conglomerate that's a world leader in energy efficient technologies. Uh, and again, uh, by saving this power uh, is, uh, is reducing the annual emissions that we need to release into the atmosphere. So as a result, uh, you know, what's really interesting here is that we've been able to progress to a world that's no longer about sustainability versus profitability. So many people want to look at this world in terms of black or white, are you with us or against us, but it's no longer that binary outcome. This is where the magic is. It's no longer about sustainability versus profitability. It's about the opportunity to create a smarter, more sustainable, resilient, and inclusive future. And so with that, Romel, I'll turn the call back over to you. <coughs> Thanks, John. That was uh, that was a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to touch on a couple of uh, aspects of your talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, Joe Biden and his uh, status as president-elect. Certainly, the policy agenda that these that uh, he and the Democrats are putting forward uh, fall in line with the rest of the world uh, with respect to the Paris Accord. Um, you know. Without getting into you know too many specifics, but I'm certainly I'm curious um, where you think a lot of those uh, those commitments dollar terms are going to land in terms of uh, what kind of investments and how does the Environmental Leaders Fund capture that? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's an important question, and, and certainly um, 
you know, with uh, the the election of President-elect Joe Biden, uh, Joe 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 Biden has certainly signaled uh, that he will be in uh, climate change will be the center of his policy over the next four years. Uh, he's already indicated that they will go and rejoin becoming a signatory of the Paris Agreement once again. Uh, and again, uh, signaling that uh, John um, uh, Kerry uh, will take up a post as the White House National Security Council as well. Uh, and, and so those are very important signals to say that climate change will be an important part. Uh, he's already, you know, he, you, he, um, his platform that uh, he went out uh, with was a $2 trillion stimulus package. Uh, where climate change was the centerpiece of that stimulus program, you know, with the divided house. Uh, we'll see what happens in Georgia in January in terms of the runoff election there, but it looks like there will be a divided uh, government in the U.S. So uh, he may not be able to get, uh, you know, all $2 trillion out, uh, but there's no question that uh, that Joe Biden is, is determined to get the U.S. in line with global trends uh, particularly in the in, in the in Europe as well as uh, even China has committed to a zero carbon economy by 2060. And uh, again, for the U.S. to be competitive, uh, they need to to ensure uh, that their policies are in line uh, with this future. And we certainly expect um, you know Joe Biden to live up to his promises. Uh, again, making sure that uh, renewable energy uh, is is uh, for for instance. Uh, uh, you know, a, a key part of his stimulus program, which again uh, is very growth oriented and very jobs oriented. So how does the Environmental Leaders Fund capture that? Those kinds yeah, so of again, thank you very much. How does it generate <laughs> uh, so, so again, if you take a look at some of the themes that the uh, that the uh, environmental leaders uh, will, uh, you know, is, is uh, th talking about in terms of new energy, uh, you know, our thesis that uh, that that the world will continue to uh, invest in the electrification of the grid, requiring alternative energy uh, and the buildup of the grid. We we invest in a, um, that, that the, the fund invests in a lot of industrial conglomerates that would benefit, for instance, that move uh, to um, to uh, the electrification of the um, uh, of the of, of the energy grid in the U.S. Water efficiency. Uh, for sustainable agriculture practices. These are all things that uh, we think uh, will be strong themes in the Biden presidency, which are themes we are already invested in uh, uh, as uh, as a result of our strategy. Good. Um, so electric vehicles, um, you know, company stocks like Tesla uh, have seen their share prices skyrocket dramatically this year in particular. Uh, do you think investors are projecting electric vehicle companies to dominate the automobile market in the coming years? And once again, I'd like to know how environmental leaders, uh, uh, you know, gets behind those investments and how um, they how they incorporate those uh, returns into the fund. Yeah. So you know, again, many um, uh, uh, countries and companies. Uh, have already uh, made commitments of uh, moving to uh, electrical vehicles. Um, for instance, um, you know, you think uh, of Honda in 2025, uh, uh, they will be, um, well, 2021, this year or next year, uh, they'll be banning diesel uh, and uh, cars in, the, in, in Europe. And by 2025, uh, they are they they are planning to go to a zero uh, the the um, traditional internal combustion engines and 100% electrical vehicles mm. and so you look at you mentioned Tesla obviously Tesla has been a, a darling of of the, of the markets uh, in 2020 as uh, you know it, it, you know, already has the market cap greater than all of the German automakers uh, which is certainly incredible but um, you know really uh, we believe that as uh, you know it's important. Uh, that the transportation sector again begins to, uh, which is a, a central cause of, of much of the world's carbon emissions, will need to electrify. And again, uh, the exact same uh, trends that we see in the US are already happening in Europe uh, and require uh, industrial companies that make component parts that will help companies reduce their carbon footprints in cars and other industrial um, uh, processes. And again, this is certainly a theme that we think will can continue over the next 10 years. And uh, certainly environmental leaders are looking for companies. You know, uh, we, you know I'll, I'll, uh, we, we don't have Tesla in the portfolio, uh, but uh, because, uh, you know, one of the things that we are looking for uh, is, is um, strong, profitable companies uh, with strong, profitable uh, earning growth profiles. Mm -hmm. 
So Tesla is not in the portfolio. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I think a lot of people would argue that electric vehicle company stock prices are way overvalued. Uh, perhaps that's uh, part of the uh, rationale behind not including it in the fund at this time. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, you know, it, it doesn't fit the profile of the fund in the sense that um, again, we're looking for companies with strong profitability uh, as well as decent valuations. And so, uh, you know, certainly they are themes that uh, have gotten the imagination of the investment public uh, that, uh, not are gen that are not generating a lot of profits. You know, that's not the way that Environmental Leaders Fund is investing in. Uh, they're, yeah. they're very st uh, strong, disciplined investment thesis about earnings growth and valuations. Okay. Good. It's good to hear. Uh, again, you also touched on uh, this earlier in your presentation with respect to oil and gas. Um, you know, Canada's oil and gas sector are, are considered by many to be the most ethical in the world. Uh, does NEI uh, divest entirely of sectors uh, that uh, are not purely environmentally friendly, or is there room in NEI's portfolios to hold Canadian energy companies, and why or why not? Yeah, so this is a fundamental question. I'm really glad, Romel, that you, you, you've you asked this question. We believe very strongly in the transition uh, that the world will be transitioning to a low carbon future. However, you know, Canada, uh, you know, in, in our marketplace, given our economy, uh, we are we are not advocating that we go to zero fossil fuels today. And so we are uh, we are very strong proponents. If you look at our 10 year uh, track record of engaging uh, companies in Canada's energy companies, uh, we have been at the forefront of getting these companies to start thinking about what their operations will look like in 2030 uh, when we have transitioned. And so, uh, we, uh, for instance, we've been talking to Suncor for over 10 years on uh, asking them to, uh, uh, you know, to 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 think about this. Uh, we've actually in, uh, raised shareholder resolutions uh, with uh, with them. And to their credit, Suncor has backed our shareholder resolutions and are now committed to reducing their carbon intensity by 30% by 2030. And so this is the type of um, um, uh, partnership uh, that NEI has with the energy sector, understanding that, um, you know, even in a world that's low carbon, they will still be a need for fossil fuels. Uh, and so we believe that companies that are of uh, the highest standards of environmental and social uh, will be well positioned to produce those fossil fuels. And Canada, you know, certainly is at the forefront, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, I was re looking at a recent uh, research report that said Canada, you know, tops, uh, it was top two in terms of ESG ratings of the top 20 uh, oil uh, uh, and gas uh, producers in, in the world. Uh, and some of our companies, uh, you know, are, are certainly have the, the highest ESG ratings out there. So, yeah, again, I think that we're well positioned, uh, but, you know, we, we can't just sit on our laurels. We, we need to continue to push uh, the innovation. I mentioned the Canadian oil and gas company at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, and if we continue to use our engineering prowess to figure out how we can take our core competencies like that in geothermal energy, uh, you know, Alberta, for instance, is a great example where uh, geothermal, uh, sorry, not geothermal, but, you know, solar and wind, they have some of this, you know, the, the best opportunities to take advantage of solar and wind. Uh, and if they meet their commitment of generating 30 percent of their um, electricity gen generation through uh, renewable energy, you know, that will that will create uh, thousands, uh, you know, uh, thousands of jobs uh, in that in, in a sector that needs uh, uh, jobs, um, uh, certainly. OK, you know, John, one last thing, you know, you touched on um, working with Suncor, to, you know, at a shareholders meeting. I think that's a really important aspect of uh, what NEI does is uh, shareholder activism. And, um, you know, you, I don't think, you, you know, we uh, you've elaborated enough on that. Can you just go through some of the details with respect to how you, um, you know, how you do this, how you push, uh, you know, the, the ESG agenda within major corporations? Right. So again, um, to thank you very much, Ramel. And, and so certain responsible investing I've touched a lot about in, in this presentation is on the investment philosophy side. How do we choose our investments? 
Uh, there's another side to responsible investing, which is called active ownership. And are you actually using the ownership uh, um, responsibilities of your shareholders to ensure that your companies understand that uh, environmental, social and government factors are important to you? And so we we have meetings, um, you know, thousands of meetings with companies, uh, uh, you know, on, on an annual basis uh, to to um, to let uh, companies know uh, that that environmental, social, and governance issues are important to us. Uh, sometimes these um, these conversations go really well, as is with Suncor. Um, you know, we've also had some very good engagements with some large rail companies on safety, um, some big grocery companies on 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 food energy. Uh, you know, in technology, obviously a big theme, uh, Romel, in 2020, you know, the five mega cap uh, technology companies have, you're up over 50% to the end of August. And so uh, you'll see that, um, uh, but, you know, for, for, for us, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with that, uh, human rights and digital privacy is becoming a big issue. And what are these technology companies doing uh, with all of your personal uh, and we think that uh, that that the highest level of governance should be on that. So, for instance, we've been talking to Alphabet, which owns Google, to say, "Hey, look, what are you doing about uh, about privacy? Every time you go and Google a search, are you protecting uh, their, their 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 privacy?" And we think that this should be a board responsibility. Uh, uh, Alphabet did not, um, you know, wasn't really responding well to that. So again, we joined um, a, a coalition and, sh and, and tabled the shareholder resolution asking Google to, uh, to, to make that a board responsibility. And while we didn't win uh, the, uh, the shareholder resolution, we certainly got their attention and uh, have now uh, uh, broadened uh, the board oversight to include things of that sort. So uh, again, uh, you know, these, are, these are some of the issues that, um, that, that, that we, uh, in our conversations with companies, not just in Canada, but globally, uh, that we're doing to ensure that uh, that that um, that uh, you know and governance and environmental issues are important, and that they're they're making progress to those, and um, and it's a, a certainly an important part of the activity that we do at NEI. Yeah, that's very impressive that um, you got Google's attention. So congratulations, even. Yeah, you know we're a little a, a little company, but uh, you know again we're we're we've got big ambitions, and again uh, we do this because we think it's important to our shareholders. We think it's important to Canadians, and uh, we will continue to advocate. And 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 bottom line though, Ramel, it's not just important to Canadians. We also think it's good business that yeah. by going out and putting uh, these uh, types of guardrails up on companies and ensuring that they have sustainable business models, that they're not polluting at will, uh, that they're sensitive to the communities that they work in. We think that these create a uh, long-term value years and most people are investing for the long-term horizon. And so we wanna make sure that the companies we invest in have a long-term time horizon as well uh, and are able to grow at, uh, at faster than, uh, than, 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 um, than average profits. Yeah, well, uh, once again, uh, John and Amy, thanks. And I'll pass it on to Sienna to wrap up our our conference uh, call here yeah so thanks amy and john for your time and a great presentation at dollar wealth we focus to help clients meet their goals and objectives and we'd be happy to meet with you and discuss how we may serve you so stay, stay safe and thank you again goodbye thank you okay thank you very Bye. much everyone thank you thank you so much Bye bye